Ever since the first Europeans came to Africa, Nairobi has been a place on the way to somewhere else, and in particular, the pearl of Africa, Uganda. In the 70s, barriers were erected between Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania, and there they stayed, until last year, when the countries agreed to form an economic union once more, reopening the rail link between Nairobi and Kampala. That's the journey I'm going on today. The idea of rebuilding East Africa's community has lumbered along like an old locomotive. When the rest of the world scrambled to build economic trading blocks, East Africans became concerned that they'd be left behind. They pulled the old idea out of sidings, gave it a fresh new coat of paint, and sent it on its way, hoping it would prove the economic engine for their future. In fact, the rail link hasn't proved to be the draw card that had been hoped. As the train pulls out from Nairobi station, we find the first and second class carriages three quarters empty. Kenya's still recovering from the economic crises of the past. A quarter of Nairobi's population lives in slums. Uh, Jumbo. Again, please. Thank you. When the train stops laboring uphill and begins to glide down the Great Rift Valley, it's impossible to resist the siren song sung by its turning wheels, telling you that this is a lucky land indeed. Kuru station, it's time to take a look at what's happening up front. The driver, James Karitu, started at the age of 17 with the old East African community. That was in the days of steam. I prefer this one. Actually, I don't have, I don't have a lot of to do, because, but that needs strength. There was steam inside. The engine was too hot to stay, but this one is a bit okay. As each station flashes past, the station master stands beside the track, holding up a kind of tennis racket. It holds what's called a token. There's one for every section of the track. So by picking up the token, the driver can be sure the track ahead is clear. For 100 kilometers from this point, the railway twists and curves, descends and climbs before emerging onto highlands on the other side. By evening, the trains reached an altitude above 9,000 feet, probably the highest point of any railway in the Commonwealth. Uganda doesn't look like Kenya, and it's impossible to miss the signs of rural poverty and of neglect. Idi Amin and other murderers did their best to wreck the country, but Uganda's done more than managed to survive. The economy is back on track, largely because the government has stuck to the medicine of structural adjustment. It's as if these farms flashing past our windows were a symbol of Uganda's regenerative powers. Tourism is now Uganda's fastest growing industry, and tourists like Anne Haviland and her husband John are choosing it in preference to Kenya because they feel that Kenya's no longer safe. This is our fourth trip. Uh, to East Africa, yes. Yes, and so this is the first time we've been encouraged to come to Uganda. There's a hold-up in the town of Jinja, the source of the River Nile. As the railway officials get on the phone, finding out what's wrong, 
passengers waiting on the platform to join the service to Kampala clamor for their money back. We've reached the end of the line a little sooner than expected. There's been a train derailment further up the line. Some might see this as a symbol of the continent, but the people have responded well, and we're going to get there anyway. So we have to go by road, and the cargo, well, that'll follow too, all in good time. <laughs> 